And we're so delighted today to have two skilled and savvy lawyers who've done quite a bit of impressive work uh, to shape the law of free speech. Uh, let me start off with uh, my friend and colleague, Bob Cormervier, who, as many of you know, is a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine's DC office, where he specializes in media and First Amendment law and the uh, law related to the emerging technologies. Bob uh, has successfully argued in the United States uh, uh, Supreme Court, United States versus Playboy Entertainment Group. Uh, and he was also uh, served successfully again uh, as counsel in United States versus uh, Stevens. Uh, I believe that the co-counsel in that case, Bob, was Patricia Millett. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, That's correct. now- uh, now The lead counsel in that case. Yes, yes, okay. Um, and both cases set important precedents in First Amendment law. Bob also uh, represented the CBS Corporation against the FCC in the Super Bowl uh, wardrobe malfunction case. Uh, Bob has litigated over a dozen cases in federal courts having to do with the First Amendment rights of public university students and faculty. Uh, this in connection with his counsel for the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE. Uh, years ago, uh, I went to Bob with a crazy idea about uh, petitioning Governor Pataki to grant a posthumous pardon to uh, the comedian Lenny Bruce. Bob paused, said, are you serious? And then thought about it and agreed and even did it pro bono. The rest, as they say, is history. Uh, Lenny was finally exon exonerated thanks to a lawyer who represented him I'll be off when he was dead. Okay. Uh, so if any of you out there need a, a lawyer who specializes in posthumous pardons, Bob Cornerbeer is your man. Uh, today we gather to hear about Bob's latest book titled The Mind of the Censor and the Eye of the Beholder, published by Cambridge University Press. It is in so many ways an extraordinary book, what with its alluring cover, its noteworthy forward by our own Floyd Abrams, and its array of applauding blurbs by several of the re leading scholars in the First Amendment world. And by way of substantive content, the book isn't too shabby either. Um, one reviewer recently hailed it, quote, as an important new contribution to the Chronicles of Free Expression, a book that succeeds admirably in charting out the history and dangers of censorship. But let us not stop there. That same reviewer found the book to be, quote, troubling and one that took a sour turn. Well, there you have it, praise and criticism. And for those who know Bob and his free speech mindset, it's just another day in the wondrous world of free speech in America. Bob, welcome to our salon. Thank and, you. And, uh, and I'm also very excited to have Katie Fowler with us today. Um, Katie, as many of you know, is senior counsel at the Knight Institute, where she focuses on threats to free speech and free press in the digital age, particularly in the area of social media. In that field, uh, Katie and her colleagues at the Knight Institute time and again set the pace when it comes to important and far-reaching litigation. I can think of no other group or firm in the country that is so far ahead of the curve when it comes to the Knight Institute and the work they're doing in the First Amendment area. For example, she was one of the lead lawyers in the Knight Institute's groundbreaking challenge to President Trump's blocking critics from his Twitter account on the ground that it violated the First Amendment. Katie is also litigating the Institute's challenge to federal regulations requiring people who apply for visas to enter the United States to register their social media handles. Before joining the Knight Institute, she was a litigation partner at Jenner and Block in Washington, D.C. And while there, she joined many occasions with Paul Smith, a noted First Amendment lawyer, and she was successful in working with Paul in challenging a California video game law in the landmark case of Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. After leaving Jenner and Block, Katie was deputy director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. Her op-eds have appeared in the New York Times and the Philadelphia Inquirer, among other places. Katie is a graduate of the Harvard Law School and clerked for Judge Rosemary Barquette to the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Katie and Bob are both friends and professional colleagues. Welcome, Katie. 
And on that note, Katie and Bob, the video conference floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for those kind words and uh, for the shout out, particularly for the work that we're doing at the Knight Institute, which uh, was just started uh, five years ago. So it's it's great. We're very grateful to have made some impact and get some recognition. Um, so I also want to thank, uh, start by thanking you and Seth for uh, inviting me to interview Bob about his fascinating book, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, for those of you who haven't had the chance to read it yet, Bob's book provides an easily digestible and highly entertaining account of many of the major censor censorship battles over the past 150 years. And in doing so, it shows how many of the individuals who sought to censor speech inadvertently contributed to the development of a robust First Amendment jurisprudence that centers around the fundamental principle that the government shouldn't be in the business of deciding what people say, read, view, or think. Um, so just getting into the book itself, um, violating the rule that you can't judge a book by its cover, and you already referred to this. Um, uh, so this is the cover of your book. And thank you, Lisa. Um, so I just wanted to start off, um, Bob, by saying, first of all, explaining uh, the thinking behind your choice of title, um, the mind of the censor and the eye of the beholder. How do you define those terms? And how are those two concepts linked? Um, and then also, if you could discuss your choice of cover art um, and what you intended to convey with that. Well, thanks, Katie. And and I, too, want to just thank everybody. I want to thank uh, uh, the Salon, uh, Ron and Seth, for uh, uh, setting up this uh, this session. Um, I owe a deep debt of gratitude to Floyd Abrams for kindly agreeing to uh, add uh, a contributor forward to the book um, and uh, for the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, the title um, is one that sort of grew out of um, the thinking that led to ultimately uh, um, maybe want to write this book because, you know, we've both been advocates for a long time on free speech issues. Um, one of the things that I was, was always fascinated by is, you know, what's driving those people who advocate restrictions on speech? Um, and so th that led to the, the first part of the, the mind of the censor uh, and uh, um, trying to understand more about free speech by analyzing what motivates censors and also the notion of the eye of the beholder well again in their eyes uh, they see uh, uh, what it is that really is an evil that they have to combat and so uh, the mind of the censor uh, the eye of the beholder governs the mind of the censor in that respect and so it was really just trying to get into it but when you try and give an elevator pitch for a book like this it's a little hard to do what's your book about well it, it's about the psychology of censorship well <laughs> Not really. And to put it that way makes it sound a little bit like a snooze fest. Basically, what I wanted to do is uh, um, tell, talk about the First Amendment through a series of stories. And as you see going through it, they're sort of interconnected uh, thematically um, in that uh, there is a certain kind of connection between the motivations behind censors from both sides or all sides of the political spectrum. Um, and I tried to show those links through this series of stories. Uh, the cover art, uh, <laughs> um, actually, I, I owe uh, Ron Collins a debt of gratitude for that as well, for pointing me in the direction of a very talented uh, cover designer, Alex Lubertazzi. If anyone out there is uh, writing a book and wants to find the, the right guy to design the, the cover, I can't recommend Alex uh, highly enough. And I thought that he really did capture um, the sort of spirit and feel of the book in in the art that he put together and this is a person who's really not just a, a graphic designer to put pretty pictures together he read the book i think really understood its themes and uh, then came up with a cover that uh, that really reflects that showing that on the on the, the bottom part the image of um, uh, venus of urbino by titian uh, a censor might behold that and then you see in the top part of the book what it would appear to be in his fevered imagination. <laughs> and so um, I, I really thought that, as you say, sometimes you can tell a book by its cover. 
exactly. Um, well, it's very, it is very, um, not provocative, but uh, eye-catching and arresting. Um, and so it does seem like some of uh, what you're talking about in the eye of the beholder is that, you know, one person may see a beautiful work of art by Titian and the other person sees a uh, frightening, alarming, hellish, you know, depiction of uh, sexuality that is very threatening. Um, yeah. And so the idea is also that the First Amendment, you know, law that has grown out of these efforts by the censors is to reinforce the view that because of those differences, the government should not be in the business of deciding uh, what speech, whether it qualifies as beautiful art or as dangerous uh, porn or whatever the issue well, is. That's right. And it's why I, I think the glory of the First Amendment is its neutrality, that it, uh, it doesn't um, evaluate the ability of the government to censor based on the worth of the ideas uh, in that uh, who do you put in charge of making that decision? It's true whether or not you're talking about political views or aesthetics or art, literature, all of those are true. The other thing too about this, and one of the things that I, I tried to focus on, is so much of our thinking about the First Amendment is geared toward the analysis of political speech. And part of that is as media lawyers, when you go back to law school, you learn about the First Amendment through the first cases, Supreme Court cases, that really began to focus on it. And those were the World War I Espionage and Sedition Act cases. Um, and so we think about the First Amendment as being born in a conflict about uh, political speech. I wanted to go back before that, before First Amendment jurisprudence developed and look at the battles over social speech, artistic speech that led to um, uh, the same disputes that ultimately were resolved by the courts in the 20th century. And those were about um, lifestyle choices, free thinkers, free lovers, um, about art, about literature. Those were the battles that were waged during the Comstock era and before we had a First Amendment jurisprudence. And ultimately, the, the victories that uh, we noticed in the 20th century grew out of arguments that were made in the 19th century. Um, and so that actually already gives a, a little entree into just describing, uh, you know, essentially what the book is, which is you start by focusing on the man of Anthony Comstock and um, and he was in the sort of late 1800s. Um, and then you use his experience and um, the features of his campaigns, censorship campaigns, um, as a sort of launching point to describe other instances of censorship and what you argue uh, that the censors share in common in terms of their approach to speech and whether or not they think um, you know the government should be restricting it. Um, so if you could explain, like, why did you choose to start with Anthony Comstock just because he's the first one, or what about him uh, in your mind personifies a censor? Um, and sets the stage for those to come. Yeah, well, Comstock um, essentially invented the idea, invented the, the profession of the professional censor. Uh, H.L. Mencken described him as uh, uh, the first of its kept professors. Uh, he started out as just a vigilante, uh, driven by his uh, religious convictions to try and censor um, uh, smut in, in New York, but he's a man whose concept of what was smut, what was obscenity, was as broad as you can imagine. And so um, later on, when he was able to successfully lobby for a federal obscenity law, uh, it included anything that was considered to be immoral. Uh, it was considered uh, anything that was about contraception, uh, preventing contraception, uh, or anything about abortion. Um, it was used to prosecute uh, even medical doctors who wrote um, home health guides because it thought it, it taught women too much about their own bodies. Uh, there was one uh, prosecution that was about uh, it in, a, a magazine included an article about the mating habits of marsupials. Uh, who knows? <laughs> he was a pretty twisted guy. Um, you know, he, as I say, he went after uh, works of art. He went after literature. Um, and um, 
he had two things going for him. One was he had this federal obscenity law that was very, very broad um, and a lack of any kind of um, constitutional jurisprudence that would limit how that law could be applied. And so, of course, to do that, he borrowed uh, the courts through the arguments he made, borrowed um, uh, cases de decided in Victorian England that basically said anything that could possibly undermine the morals of a person who's susceptible to such influences in a case called Regina versus Hickland um, could be uh, could be prohibited as obscene. And that was the law for 40, well, more than 40 years, but his career lasted 40 years where he was enforcing the law personally as a special agent of the post office uh, under those standards. How did he, I mean, you talk about this in the books, what what motivated him personally? Like, why did he take on this cause? But also, why did he get so much power? How was, I mean, I think he was 29 or something when he, he sort turned of 27 the day after the law was passed. Um, and so it's like what is called the Comstock Act. Yeah. And which elements of it are still in the books. Um, but um, it's really, well, almost inexplicable that uh, an individual like that could have asked so much power in such a brief amount of time. He had begun his vigilante campaign in New York just a year before the law was passed. It was one year to the day uh, that the law was adopted. He had come to the attention, well, he had a knack for, for using and attracting publicity. He would take reporters with him on his citizens arrest raids. That attracted the attention of the patriarchs who um, ran the YMCA. Uh, in New York, and they had a special committee for uh, uh, addressing vice. Um, it, Comstock quickly became a fixture in that committee, and they sponsored a trip to Washington for him to lobby for this new federal law. Um, he was successful, and one of the uh, byproducts of that is that he was also appointed a special agent of the post office. He thereafter founded uh, an organization called the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, which <laughs> if the name doesn't say it all, uh, the official seal for the society uh, does as well. If you see on the left of their seal, an image of a, an officer leading a miscreant off to prison. And on the right side of the seal, you see a Victorian gentleman in a top hat dumping armloads of books into a fire. And so that uh, that explained both, there it is, uh, the, uh, the spirit with which this law was enforced. And as I say, Comstock was uh, not shy about using the full extent of his powers, and particularly against people who questioned the propriety of his law. As I say, a lot of these were driven by his uh, Christian uh, convic uh, convictions. I can talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but the people he wanted to prosecute the most were people among the free thought community because he thought scoffing at God led to all other sins. Um, he particularly wanted to go after uh, people who believed in free love uh, because there was at the time a, a vociferous debate among people who believed that marriage was slavery, that uh, people should be free to have all kinds of sexual connections. And so he made a special um, target of, of those people in that community. Uh, as I say, he went after medical doctors. He particularly went after women physicians as well. So um, it was very, very broad. Um, as I say, he um, this was grounded in his strong Christian belief. Um, and he had been of this bent of mind forever. I mean, he um, when he was a, a soldier in the Civil War, one of the things that he would do was not just not take his liquor rations, he would very ostentatiously dump them out in front of his fellow soldiers, uh, something that uh, did not make him particularly popular with that the other troops. <laughs> Actually, just one other note, there, there's a, a terrific biography from 1927, um, probably the definitive biography of, of Comstock uh, by Haywood Brune and Margaret Leach called um, uh, Anthony Comstock, Roundsman of the Lord. And one of its really defining features is that they reprint excerpts from his diaries. They have photostats of those excerpts in this book. And um, at the time when it was written, Comstock had been dead for some 12 years and the society, 
lent them the diaries to use for the book, but it was to devastating effect <laughs> because it showed basically uh, that a lot of his motivations were driven by his extreme feelings of guilt over a habit of masturbation, that uh, he was uh, constantly going after those things that he thought were sinful, which basically anything that I think turned him on. Um, and so, um, you know, that is, uh, that's what drove him. And he amassed that kind of power because he came to Congress at an opportune time. They were in the throes of trying to overcome the scandal of the credit mobilier scandal. Um, and uh, they needed a distraction. And this law was, was a good, uh, 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 you know, a good vehicle for that. Uh, he amassed power in enforcing the law because there, there was no constitutional doctrine to restrain him. And that wouldn't come along for, well, really in, in this area until 1957, when the area of obscenity was constitutionalized in Roth versus United States. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about all of his various campaigns and just reading about your book. And you were saying that, you know, it wasn't just, I mean, he boasted that he led some of the people that he persecuted and prosecuted, he boasted that he led them to commit suicide. Isn't that That's correct? Right. He, he, he personally was responsible for some 15 suicides um, and uh, was, was really very proud of that fact. Uh, he would boast of the number of convictions that he had. He claimed that he had uh, convict, arrested over 3,800 people and, and obtained guilty or uh, pleas or convictions in uh, almost 3,000 of those cases. Um, or as he very colorfully put it, because as I say, he had a real flair for public relations. He said that he had convicted enough people to fill a railroad train full with 60 coaches of 60 people and a 61st coast coach almost full. And so <laughs> using those kinds of very, very colorful illusions, uh, he would talk about his, his successes. Uh, he made up a lot of his statistics as it turns out, but nonetheless, he was responsible for lots and lots of convictions lots of arrests, and he claims to have uh, destroyed over 160 tons of obscene literature and 4 million pictures. Wow. Um, it, it does seem like some of his motivation, as you kind of talk about, it's a little bit of he doth protest too much, that the thing that he's most focused on, obviously, is, is potentially the thing that he was most ashamed of, clearly, but also very interested in. So, um, you know, throughout your book, and this is a key term, uh, you refer to what you call the censor's dilemma. Um, and you say that uh, Comstock personifies that and that many of the other people uh, as well. Um, how do you define that term? And how do you see it reflected in, in Comstock's successors as you describe them in the book? Yeah, well, it's more uh, something that affected his successors than it did Comstock himself, because it really is the illegitimacy of the idea of the censor that grew out of both a culture, of, a culture of free expression in the United States and the law of free expression, both of which grew over time in the 20th century, um, mutually reinforcing one another. Um, Comstock felt no compunction about being a censor. He relished the title and, and uh, thought that that was just, you know, God's natural way. Um, it's only because he essentially destroyed the concept of the professional censor, even as he made it as powerful as he was, that those who follow in his footsteps feel a certain amount of um, guilt or trepidation about being censored to the point that their defining characteristic is that they uh, tr try to deny that, that what they are up to is censorship. Um, and, and the characteristics are these. I mean, first, the, the censor <clears throat> believes that the government's power should be, they should be able to marshal the government's power to either suppress or restrict that speech they consider to be harmful or, or in Comstock's words, evil, or to promote or require speech that they find particularly beneficial. Uh, second characteristic is absolute certainty. The chief defining characteristic of a censor is they know what, <laughs> what speech should be permitted or, or promoted or, or restricted. Um, and, and they are right and shouldn't be questioned. Um, and then uh, the third characteristic, sense Comstock, is uh, a certain defensiveness about that to try and say what they're up to isn't censorship. Either that speech isn't really speech or it isn't, shouldn't be protected. It's an exception to the First Amendment. 
Um, and so what they're up to is not censorship. So, um, you know, in the other examples that uh, I, I cite in the book, all of them uh, basically say that they are not doing censorship, even though they're really very upfront about the fact that they want to restrict certain kinds of speech, just don't call them censor. Yeah, so that is definitely their dilemma. Um, but you're right, I do think that you do see that um, approach of, of one of the things I think of, that you sort of talk about throughout your book is defining the sphere of protected speech. If you just simply take it out and define it in a way that you know doesn't include the speech you want to restrict, then you can say, or oh, I'm not a censor at all. You know, I'm, the First Amendment just protects speech within this sphere, not outside of it. But that's right. And you know, that was one of the things that I came to sort of understand in writing the book. I think it sort of crystallized this thought in my mind because, you know, when you learn about First Amendment law and you try and people are always trying to define the purpose of the First Amendment, what does it protect and why, uh, you know, you will have various theories saying that it's there to protect democratic self-government or it's there for the self-enlightenment function or it's there for the emotive function or it's there for, you know, whatever purpose. And for those critics who will say that it shouldn't protect certain kinds of speech, the main argument will be, well, it doesn't promote self-government like this, or it doesn't perform, you know, it doesn't work in the marketplace like this, whatever their argument is. And therefore say, because of that, I can exclude this speech um, because it doesn't fall within those parameters. But that's where I, I thought studying censors and what they are up to really taught me more about the First Amendment. Because when you think about it, the Constitution is really a, a document to govern power relationships, right? I think we learn more about the nature of free speech by seeing what the First Amendment was designed to prevent rather than to try and speculate about what it was trying to promote. And it was what it was trying to prevent is the exercise of government power over the human mind. Um, so we already saw this slide, but it used the term uh, the Comstock effect. Um, if you could both, you know, describe what the Comstock effect is, um, and I think it has a relationship to what we call the Streisand effect, but particularly in light of that uh, painting image that was uh, that Lisa showed earlier. If you, Lisa, if you want to pull it up again. Yes, the um, the Comstock effect. You're you're absolutely right. It is the Victorian era version of the Streisand effect. For those of you unfamiliar with the strife sand effect, it is a term used to describe comically ineffective efforts used to keep uh, speech away from people or certain kinds of expression away from people because of Barbara Streisand's uh, efforts to ineffectively try and prevent uh, California Coastal Commission from having photos of her Malibu home. Um, in the case of the Comstock effect, this was one of the two ways in which Comstock undermined his own efforts, both in the public mind through the Comstock effect and through basically going too far in trying to prosecute things and creating essentially a First Amendment bar that uh, uh, then ultimately was successful in promoting uh, First Amendment rights. But the Comstock effect was how the culture pushes back, and that is by trying to suppress things, Comstock only made them more desirable and only made people want them more. The image, the Paul Shabbos uh, September Morn was a, uh, an image from the um, Paris Salon that uh, uh, had come to the United States and uh, had become a very popular print. Um, Comstock uh, in a front page New York Times story was um, depicted trying to remove it from a gallery window um, in New York, uh, and um, there's a very comic exchange with the clerk that the Times reported on about his efforts to suppress it. It made the, the print wildly popular, uh, and uh, more and more people wanted it. There are a number of examples of this where, for example, Comstock had tried to prevent uh, the showing of uh, the play, the presentation of the play, Mrs. Warren's Profession by George Bernard Shaw, um, and uh, sent a letter to the theater owner suggesting that he shouldn't put on this play. Uh, the owner, being no dummy, uh, realized that there was great publicity value here, so he leaked to the press. Not only that Comstock had sent him this letter, but publicly invited him to attend rehearsals so that he could say that the play, see for himself that the play was uh, of great merit. Uh, Comstock, of course, refused, but it made the play so popular that the New York police had to call out the reserves to control the crowds on opening night. 
Um, you know, and then there are numerous examples of this. Uh, Comstock wrote a, an essay in uh, 1888 called Vampire Literature, where he describes a fashionably dressed young woman who came to his office to ask him if, at the advice of her publisher, whether or not her novel was could be published or whether it was too salacious. And Comstock recoiled in horror, saying, of course, this can't be published. So she responded, well, would you promise me to just to attack it just a little so that it will get some notoriety? <laughs> and Comstock uh, was not in on the joke. Uh, he, he thought it was, it was horrible. And, you know, he, he was describing for himself uh, the Comstock effect. And, and you see that again and again in these various episodes of censorship. I'm not sure if it's the same, but just it, if ever anyone says they want to recall an email, then I definitely want to read it. You know? uh, so, that's true. <laughs> I always think that's the worst thing you can do. I mean, maybe. Not, but, um, that's right. Uh, so, and then you also talk about um, what you say you call the uh, Comstock playbook, uh, the tech or sort of the what attitudes he used or techniques he used in his advocacy to censor speech that you say is repeated by people who also are seeking to re restrict speech throughout the 20th century. And if you can just give uh, sort of a, like a description of what the Comstock playbook is. Well, sure. And, and there are a number of factors. And, and when I was first writing the book, I was just gonna start with chapter one on Comstock. But there was so much material uh, that uh, it ultimately became three chapters. Uh, chapter one was just a description of who he was and, and what he had done during his lifetime and how significant it was. Uh, the next chapter was on his legacy. Did he actually achieve what he set out to achieve? And it details the ways in which he had undermined his own efforts and ruined the, the title of censor for everyone to come after him, at least in the United States. And, and, uh, free society. Um, and the third chapter and it's really a rather short chapter, but just tries to describe the tactics that he used. Um, and it, it includes like using overheated rhetoric and ap apocalyptic metaphors, uh, trying to use false statistics to uh, bolster his, his weak arguments, frankly. Um, and that came from his history as being a dry goods clerk before he was a professional censor. He just kept records of everything. And he found that it strengthened his arguments if he could claim um, it's 60 cars full of 60 passengers each and, and just the numbers of his arrests and all of that. He turns out he even inflated those. Uh, but again, he used the, those kinds of arguments. Uh, he would equate a defense of a book with a love of, of obscenity, which is something that you see a lot. When people will say, if you're defending that, you must you must be whatever the evil thing is. Um, and so I sort of kept a running list of about 10 different things that he would do as being the elements of his playbook. And, and then in a chapter toward the end of the book, show how people who advocate for speech restrictions today borrow elements of that playbook. And, you know, moving on from Comstock, um, the sort of chronologically, the next big uh, speech battle you address are the attacks on, maybe, or maybe it's not the next one, but anyway, I was particularly interested, as you can imagine, um, from my work in the video games cases, the yes. case uh, EMA, very, or Brown v. EMA now, um, which you also did an amicus brief to the Supreme Court um, for the comic book. Industry, Legal yeah. Yes, that was great. And um, but anyway, so at the time that I was litigating the video game cases where, you know, we were challenging state laws that would restrict uh, violent video games, um, I hadn't known about Fred Wortham, but um, I was really struck uh, the similarity of the arguments that were being made about video games in the 2000s were almost identical to the arguments being made by Fred Wortham in the 50s it, and 60s. It, it's, um, really, it's really remarkable, uh, yeah, and, how, how, the similarities. And that's one of the things that we tried to point out in the amicus brief for the comic book Legal Defense Fund, that these arguments uh, just keep getting recycled uh, all the time. Um, and in terms of selecting the examples, I didn't try and select examples that were necessarily the most important free speech battles in our history, but I tried to select examples based on the 
the personalities involved, the sensors involved, and how they illustrated the mindset of the sensor in the same way that Comstock did. And so Frederick Wordham was a, a, a prime example of that. He was a psychiatrist of uh, some note who made uh, his anti-comic book crusade a centerpiece uh, and arguing that comic books in the same way that video games are advocated today, that uh, they um, uh, cause juvenile delinquency, they cause uh, uh, Batman and Robin comics and Wonder Woman comics cause kids to turn gay, uh, you know, all of those sort of junk um, um, social science arguments. Um, and he had a, uh, a book that came out at the same time as the uh, hearings um, before the uh, Kefauver Committee uh, called Seduction of the Innocent. And it was just a collection of, as it turned out to be um, later, uh, we found out discredited anecdotes that uh, basically were his uh, conclusions. But what was interesting is that, uh, uh, two things. One thing is, Wordham's battles over comic books grew out directly of Anthony Comstock's fights against dime novels, which he argued in you know the 19th century um, were responsible for causing kids to turn to crime and all of that. I mean, it was basically the same argument and Wordham recycled it. And it wasn't a partisan thing because, or one that was necessarily grounded in their philosophical outlook because uh, Comstock was um, basically motivated by his religious impulses. Frederick Wordham was a man of science and uh, a member of the liberal intel intelligentsia, but he simply took on this crusade, but he emulated Comstock in so many ways. You could say in many ways they were the same man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought that was fascinating. Obviously Comstock was much more motivated by religion and a sort of traditional view of morality, um, Victorian morality, but uh, Wortham is, you know, appealing to social science. And, you know, we definitely address that in the video games cases Absolutely. because there were a few social scientists who were also, frankly, advocates exactly. um, who would go and say there are 500 studies that show that video, violent video games cause people to become more harmful, to think bad thoughts, to be uh, amoral, uh, et cetera. Um, and once you start looking at the science itself, I mean, I am, you know, sort of, I wonder whether other areas of free speech where people are referring to, um, you know, social science as establishing the harm. Um, but then when courts are looking at it through the context of, you know, strict scrutiny or, or searching judicial scrutiny, at least from a lawyer's standpoint, and at least in those video games cases, it was pretty easy to pull it apart. Um, yes. But yeah. And, and you know, uh, the parallels are really astonishing. When, when you think about it and, and, you know, exactly the same arguments were made. Social science was, had not come as far when, when um, Comstock was around, but he relied on what was considered to be the cutting edge, cutting edge social science of his time uh, and um, use that to, to bolster his arguments. Um, but again, the, the same arguments are made again and again. And it's remarkable too, the arguments in favor of freedom of speech and free, and free expression were made unsuccessfully throughout the 1870s and 80s. Um, it kept losing in court. Uh, an organization was formed in the early part of the 20th century, the Free Speech League, that kept fighting all these battles. But it was before the development of First Amendment jurisprudence uh, and, and the levels of protection that we have now. Um, but it was efforts like that that ultimately led to successes in the courts. At the same time, in the I mean, it's interesting because some of what you point out is that some of the censors, more from the 20th century, appear to be kind of out of step with the cultural norms. You have Newt Minow saying this is a vast uh, wasteland, whereas a lot of other people think there's, I mean, some people might say, yeah, some television is not so great or enriching, et cetera. But a lot of people think it's actually very important and, you know, certainly in the golden age of television, profound art. Um, but what I was kind of interested in is you, you say that people were ridiculing Comstock in his time and also making fun of, you know, uh, Wortham and, or Wortham, I don't know how you pronounce it, um, or, or Newt Minow. At the same time, they actually had a fair amount of traction in the popular culture. You have Fred, uh, The Seduction of in Innocence, which is a great title, but it's being published in women's magazines and, yes. um, you know, kind of a moral panic about 
what is this, yeah, the, our, our new generation of juvenile delinquents becoming and sort of yeah. the push and pull between, yes, uh, it may seem out of stop, step with popular culture, yet um, on the sort of formal sense, a lot of the culture is saying, we don't want this. We think this is bad. We're worried about it. Yeah, well, a lot of that exploits, um, you know, rifts in the culture or as you have cultural change. You saw that with the battle over rock and roll, where in the uh, 1950s you had psychiatrists, and again, prominent psychiatrists like uh, like Wordham, but he, it was others who, who would express these opinions, that rock and roll was tribal music that was going to uh, lead to the downfall of civilization and, and you know, all of this kind of thing. Um, and ultimately, you had a couple of things happening. You had a growing cultural acceptance of this new art form. And at the same time, you had growing legal protections. And those things interacted with one another. As things became more uh, penetrated the culture more, uh, it became more possible for uh, advocates to make uh, successful arguments in court. And what I've tried to do in the book is to show the interaction between those cultural elements and the legal ones. Uh, I don't try and focus on one story to the exclusion of the other. Um, speaking of Newt Min Minow, um, you know, I, I thought to some extent you discuss, uh, you know, the former FCC chairman, his, you know, famous speech about the vast wasteland, and then the, the his efforts to regulate not, as you'd sort of said at the beginning of this, not to censor speech, but to actually require speech that he believes is in the public interest. Um, in your mind, is there a difference uh, in the, what I'm trying to think, the negative quality of censorship, whether it's being, you know, motivated by a desire to stamp out speech? I mean, could you make an argument that if you're just arguing, if you're seeking to have the government regulate speech or provide speech that serves other important social goals, that that's simply not the kind of evil uh, as kind of come stock censorship? Well, sure. And, and I understand how some people may find it surprising to include among a list of censors um, someone who is uh, in a position where, as a bureaucrat, they're arguing for, quote, public interest censorship. I, I think of it as um, sort of eat your vegetables, I know what's good for you kind of censorship, as opposed to the uh, the execution of, of books that, uh, uh, that Comstock was. But as I said, as I defined censors in the beginning of the book, it's either those who think that they know which speech should be prohibited because it's evil, or which speech should be compelled because it's so uniquely beneficial. And uh, so anytime you put government in charge of sort of shaping the culture in that way, uh, maybe censor is a too harsh a term for that, but it is still, for First Amendment purposes, indistinguishable from, um, from a uh, restriction on speech. And the points that I make in the book on Newton Minow are basically the ways in which regulating broadcasting differently from other media um, do contravene traditional First Amendment values as they developed generally for media and how the theories that supported that kind of regulation are really based on myths um, and that ultimately it had the um, opposite effect of what was intended. It made the presentation over broadcasting much more bland, despite the aspirations of the chairman who said, we want you to have the best programming. It led to, and some I cite in the book, to the blandest decade of television in American history. You contrast that with what we have now where with streaming services that are not subject to, to any kind of regulation, a renaissance in uh, video entertainment, uh, much more choice, much more um, uh, hard hitting, um, more artistic presentations um, than at any time uh, during the uh, regulation of the one video medium that was available, and that was television. So uh, again, I mean, people can debate this, whether or not you should put um, uh, uh, the same mantle on Newton Minow as chairman of the FCC as you do Anthony Comstock. I don't think they're equ equivalents in terms of their what they did. I mean, for one thing, Anthony Comstock had a much more profound impact on our society than Newton Minow ever would. But by the same token, both are using the levers of government to control speech. And in First Amendment terms, that's censorship. You know, I, as, as I was reading the, this chapter on um, 
the fairness doctrine and red lion um, versus uh, Tornillo or Tornillo. Um, it brought my, to mind something that is at the forefront of our thought at the Knight Institute in particular, which is the current, um, I think, concern about the impact of social media on free speech, on democracy, um, on our elections, et cetera. There's a lot of concern about the harms associated with social media and calls from both the left and the right, um, right. to regulate social media. Right. And in fact, the Knight Institute, we recently filed an amicus brief in the 11th Circuit, um, which is dealing with the challenge to the Florida law that- case, yeah. Yeah, okay. So in that, in that case, we have actually distinguished ourselves, I think, from other um, First Amendment organizations in arguing that we think that the law is unconstitutional. However, we have urged uh, in the brief that the 11th Circuit not adopt to uh, a, a view of the First Amendment that would preclude any regulation of social media companies. In particular, I think, you know, the Institute is focused on things like privacy protections for consumers or transparency requirements where, you know, a social media company just has to make, you know, be transparent about its content moderation rules or what, what are the rules of the road for the users. So, you know, as I was reading about the fairness doctrine and your description of it, it really seemed that there were a lot of parallels. And I was wondering, uh, you know, what lessons do you think from that are applicable to uh, the problems that have been associated or people are concerned about with social media and calls for regulation of that? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. And I think it's the, the challenge we face, if the primary challenge we face uh, today. Uh, how, how do you navigate uh, the, those values? Um, I don't get into, um, you know, social media in this book. Maybe that, that'll be the next book. Um, but I think there are lessons to be learned from our experience with regulating broadcasting, and particularly as I see um, proposals, including from some people who I have great admiration for proposing to have these kinds of regulations um, uh, you know, transposed or updated to apply to, to social media. I think the shortest answer to all that is to ask the question, who do you put in charge of it? And, you know, I think you don't have to think very far back in our history to think of how a president could manipulate that kind of power uh, or other executive officials uh, in ways that are pernicious. And that was the experience with the Fairness Doctrine. As much as it sounds like a, you know, good idea, let's all be balanced and, and cover controversial issues. Um, the, the difficulties in administration led to the, the outcomes that it never served the purposes for which it was adopted. Um, and it was used by those in power in malign ways. Um, and I, I tell the story of how it was used uh, both in the uh, Kennedy administration to go after right-wing radio uh, uh, preachers mainly, who attacked uh, the Kennedy administration, and it was specifically designed as a program to hobble them. Um, the Nixon administration used it uh, in malign ways as well. And so the question is, is there a problem with social media that is um, so bad that it cannot be made worse by government intervention? And the answer to that is usually the proposals to fix the problem are worse than the problem itself. I mean, I, I, you know, I personally have sympathy for that argument. Um, I think in theory, uh, certain laws, you know, transparency stuff or privacy stuff may not directly restrict speech or even have a chilling effect if written a certain way. But um, it does seem to me that your, your biggest concern is if you have too flexible of a standard, um, you know, first of all, it can be put in the hands of government, uh, you know, government employees, and you don't know how they're going to apply it. And also, it may not, you know, they may apply it in a way that you don't like against people that you, you know, you care about their speech. Um, so, and that was the very problem with the quote public interest standard for broadcast regulation, right? It means everything, and it means nothing. Uh, it means whatever the regulator in charge at a given time decides is in the public interest, and. Um, you know, Newton Minow's response to that was uh, when people complained about it being a fake standard was to say, well, why would you want to find out how close you can dance to the edge of the cliff? 
uh, meaning, you know, if we drew a, 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 a clear line for you, um, that would be too easy for you. We basically want to institutionalize some kind of chilling effect. Um, you know, and it, it, when, I, when I say that uh, having government involved can only make things worse, I'm not saying that there should be no regulation of any kind. It's just that what I tried to point out in the book is the dangers of just allowing uh, government ultimate flexibility to um, sort of try and do brain surgery on the First Amendment. And uh, I think when it comes to Internet speech, uh, I mean, you can see this operating, for example, where Section 230 has become the focal point for all these debates over social media. And what you see are mainly progressives arguing, well, we ought to give the social media companies or incent the social media companies to exert more control so that they will eliminate bad speech of you know various kinds. And you can list it, whether it's untruthful speech or um, offensive speech or you know harmful speech or um, uh, speech about health information, all of that. We should give these companies more incentive to regulate speech more, which is exactly the opposite position they took when it came to network neutrality, ironically enough. And then you see uh, the proposals coming from the right saying, well, we need to eliminate the platform's ability to regulate speech, uh, which uh, is, again, a, a reversal of the network neutrality position. And so, again, it all becomes part of this um, you know, polarized stew. And when you think how that would translate into policy, again, I'm getting far afield from the book, but, you know, when you're talking about learning from the past and how you would apply those lessons to the future, uh, I think uh, what we experience with broadcast regulation uh, provides plenty of warning signals for what we might do with social media. Well, I certainly found it uh, illuminating and interesting to see some of the same arguments being made, you know, 60 years ago. Uh, that people are making about social media now, that social media is a new kind of form of communication, new medium of communication that's fundamentally different from other kinds, older kinds. And not that you shouldn't take into account, you know, the specific attributes of each medium of communication, but I don't know, I do think there is sort of uh, like history repeating itself in many of yes. these. Um, I'm sure you think that too. Um, okay, so I thought maybe we should open up uh, to questions because we're almost at six. This has flown by. Yeah. That sounds great, Katie. And, and Bob, thank you very much. That was wonderful discussion. Um, let me just uh, interject here to sort of tell folks what they can do. Uh, one is you can put a question in the chat. Uh, the preferred way to do it, however, is to click on your participants menu. And uh, in the, at the bottom of that menu, there is a little thing that looks like raising your hand. And if you click on that, it will tell us that you're raising your hand. And then Lisa, can unmute you and you can actually ask your question, perhaps have some discussion with Katie and Bob. Um, so why don't we see, it looks like we may actually have a uh, question here in the chat. Ron is asking, uh, can you say a few things about government official social media censorship and the state action requirement? You may have already well, no, you, there's more probably you want to say about that. Which of us? It's <laughs> both of you. <laughs> you can you can duke it out as to who goes first. Well, Katie's the one doing these these cases, and so I think she should go first. Sorry, I didn't. So the question is, I can't see the check. Do you mind saying it again? I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. Can you say a few things about government officials, social media censorship, and the state action requirement? Oh my God, I could say so many things, but I'm not going to hijack uh, <laughs> Bob's uh, talk. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, I mean, we have, you know, we have litigated these cases, including primarily or the most, you know, famous of which against um, President Trump, where you do have this phenomenon of a lot of public officials who are either using their personal uh, social media accounts or establish a, a, a social media account on their own so that's not being set up by the government. And then they're using it to 
what we argue, you know, further their duties as a public official. So they're using it in a lot of the ways that they might have traditionally used a uh, town hall with their constituents or just as a way to report to the people and hear from the people about their work as a government official. And so in a lot of our cases where we have sued people, government officials for blocking people from social media in, you know, in the Trump case, the government basically conceded that Trump blocked our plaintiffs based on viewpoint, which, as we all know, is, you know, a slam dunk from a First Amendment standpoint as a plaintiff. Um, and so I think recognizing that the government put almost all of its efforts into arguing that this was not state action and the First Amendment did not even apply because it was Trump's own personal account. And through our litigating of these cases, you know, we have a number of decision saying you have to sort of have a functional view, not a formalistic view. If a perf if a public official is using an ostensibly personal account, but to carry out their duties of office, then it should be considered the work of a government employee and subject to state action and subject to the First Amendment's requirements of viewpoint neutrality, et cetera. Um, not everyone agrees with that. And obviously, or, uh, you know, for those of our, <laughs> um, in the Trump case, uh, it was ultimately dismissed as moot because Trump was no longer president. Um, so unfortunately, that's no longer considered binding precedent. But there are other courts like the Fourth Circuit and others that have recognized that. But yeah. and, and the flip side of that is you have uh, a number of uh, litigants arguing that uh, social media platforms are state actors and therefore have to be bound by by constitutional rules. And the courts so far have been uniform in rejecting that argument. Yeah, but we'll see because you have you have I mean, I think, you know, Bob, you were talking about this, but you have uh, Justice Thomas in a concurrence in the de the mootness decision of the Supreme Court in our case against Trump saying, oh, I, state action, you know, th that the private companies, the private social media platforms, should either be considered um, uh, common carriers or places of public accommodation, which right. to me seemed quite different from what they had, you know, held in Halleck, but. Um... It, well, exactly. And that's one out of nine. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, I mean, again, it shows how the the inconsistencies in, in how these arguments are being made, just in the juxtaposition between network neutrality and Section 230 reform, you now see uh, conservative justices uh, talking about regulating private businesses in a way that we're unheard of. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from Lynn. Hi. Hi. Um, assuming you guys can all hear me, it's nice to see you. I know you can't see me. And I will say uh, that I'm missing the, uh, you know, the refreshments that traditionally go with the First Amendment <laughs> Salon. But all that being said, um, this is super interesting. Here's my question uh, for you, Bob and Katie. And and harks in some ways to the video cases, but you know maybe it maybe Instagram is uh, more of the moment. If if we actually had some scientific studies that did in fact show that the speech at issue, whether it be violent video games or uh, you know anorexia uh, TikToks, um, are actually statistically significant in showing that there are harms to children whether they're more more likely to beat up people or pull a gun out or or you know become anorexic would your position on on sort of the censoring impulse uh, change at all not necessarily uh, and, and the reason for that is if if you're talking about the answer depending on how good the science is um, you know what that goes to is the level of the government's interest Right. If, if you're saying that means that the interest is now compelling instead of substantial, then I, I would plug that into sort of a standard First Amendment analysis. And if, again, you're regulating based on content or viewpoint, then it's still going to have to satisfy strict scrutiny. I think many of the First Amendment cases don't depend on the speech being harmless or futile uh, or not having a negative effect. Uh, it's, again, saying that the presumption for protecting speech is strongly in favor of protecting speech and the burden by the government to show why the, the, the interest is so compelling and the means being used so narrow that you can justify that kind of regulation. But I don't think it comes down to how good the studies are. That was a great question, 
question, Lynn, and, and I had also thought something along those lines of, of, you know, from your view is the issue that you don't think that speech causes harm or that you think that um, the downsides from regulating it outweigh the harms or something else. Like, yeah, I mean, I feel that, you know, I've often argued in the cases and I did in the video, violent video game cases that 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 the law did not show that vid, that watching or playing violent video games causes you to go out and become violent. Um, lots of people, you know, there might be a coral correlative, you know, relationship or there might be there are plenty of people who watch or consume images of violence, either in movies, et cetera, and don't become violent. On the other hand, it is true that it, as a person in the world, it seems that speech is extremely powerful and can have quite pernicious effects. Yeah. Um, and I wonder sort of in your in your job as an anti-censor, you know, wh how you feel about those issues. But the, the other the other point, too, and we had this in the Playboy case where the government's interest was in protecting children from exposure to random bits of pornography uh, and mm -hmm. We did not argue that children would be unaffected by it or wouldn't be harmful for children, but instead um, relied on, uh, you know, other aspects of uh, First Amendment analysis. And that is, you know, how how widespread is the problem? I mean, you start with the understanding that only one third of American households uh, have children under 18. And so do you have a one size fits all solution for everybody when it's going to be by definition over, overly inclusive? Uh, you have to look at how compelling the interest is as well as how narrow the solution is um, and i think that i suspect that would also be the case with looking at studies for the harms of various things on social media whether it's causing young women to be anorexic or or whatever else i'm sure you'll find that some people are susceptible to uh, some messages others aren't uh, how many households are affected and, and all of that so it's the question of you have to look at whether or not the solution scales and whether or not it works within traditional First Amendment analysis. Yeah, I mean, I do think there is a reason to be often at least skeptical in a or curiously skeptical of claims about the social science, because, you know, I remember in one in the video games case, one of the social scientists was very adamant, yes, and in, in cross-examination, actually, Paul Smith, the district court, got him to admit that he thought that showing someone just a picture of a gun mm -hmm. would make them more violent. Mm -hmm. And I think that was pretty effective in the judge in that case. But um, Oh, David, we have a, quite another question. Uh, well, it's my first question, at least this salon, sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <sorry. laughs> at least I think. Um, Bob, I uh, wondered in uh, researching and writing this book, uh, uh, and given that ju uh, some judges at least uh, have the mind of a censor uh, <laughs> as opposed to the eye of the beholder, um, did you learn anything or anything that you could convey to uh, other litigators in making uh, more effective arguments, either in briefs or at oral argument? Um, it's difficult to say in those terms. And, and uh, hi, David, it's, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, I, this wasn't written really as a law book per se. It's not uh, uh, written uh, as a practitioner's guide of any kind. It's more to just provide sort of a uh, sort of a, a more um, um, integrated analysis of how culture and law ha have worked uh, and 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 how uh, we see the same arguments recurring I think you know from a practitioner standpoint we've heard a little bit on this call uh, with um, you know Katie and I describing how these arguments were in, had an interplay in in the video game case where um you know learning those lessons from the past uh and how things uh, moral panics that worked in the case of dime novels and comic books and we see it replaying with um, um uh, you know video games and and I mean that now we'll see it with uh, and we are seeing it with uh, social media and that is we need to learn those lessons from the past uh and ask ourselves whether or not we're replaying uh, 
the same thing. One of the things that's really fascinating about this is to whenever the issue is hot, you have people who are advocating restrictions now saying, well, this is nothing like uh, those earlier times. Those efforts at censorship were just silly. We were misguided. But now we're on to it. Now we know the real uh, evil that needs to be combated. We saw this during the 1985 hearings on, quote, porn rock, where uh, the ladies of the Parents Music Resource Center were constantly arguing, well, this is not at all like the, the battle against rock and roll, when in fact it was exactly like the battle against rock and roll. Um, and um, now their efforts from 1985 appear quaint at best. And so having some kind of historical perspective and seeing how we might be repeating these mistakes from the past can be something that is useful to an advocate. And I think it, it did help in the, uh, in the case of video games. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I thought that the the argument about how um, people had treated video games, I mean, sorry, comic books were, were being the same and the, the novels, which right nowadays, everybody would probably be thrilled if kids went off and read Dime Store novels. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, they'd want them to read yeah. them. <laughs> All right. But um, it is pretty remarkable. But I did, I still had people, including people in the media bar, um, when we were working on those cases saying, oh, no, 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 but video games are different, you know, because oh, yeah. you're actually using a controller. So when you kill someone, you're actually killing them, which of course you're right. not, you're, you know, your avatar is, but. Um, right. Uh, so one thing I was going to ask, uh, just because I didn't have, we don't have a pending question is, you know, I there could have been so many more controversies that you could have covered. Um, and I assume at some point you just had to finish your book and you know you couldn't do everything. But if you were to write another chapter to the, the book, is there any particular issue you would wanna focus on? Well, there were some issues that I had in my original outline that I didn't include in the book. Um, movie censorship, for example. And one of the reasons I, I ultimately decided not to do that chapter is because I focused as much as I could on the defining personality. Uh, as I said, it was focused on the mind of the censor. I wanted to show how the Comstock mindset kept repeating in various incarnations. And so there was the chapter on um, on comic books with Frederick Wardham, the chapter on music censorship with uh, Tipper Gore and, and uh, PMRC, uh, the chapter on broadcast regulation personified by uh, the views of Newton Minow and uh, the broadcast indecency chapter focuses on Brent Bussell and the Parents Television Council. But I, I needed to have sort of a figurehead, someone who really voiced the same things that had motivated Comstock, um, although for their pet issues as opposed to his broad scale. Um, movie censorship didn't have that. It had various organizations like the Catholic Legion, uh, Legion of Decency. You had well, the Hayes office and you had Joseph Breen, who were mainly functionaries. I mean, they weren't um, zealots in the same way that, that Comstock was. There are a lot of censorship stories to tell, and many of which that illustrate the same, um, some of the same history. But I, I focused in this book on ones that had a defining personality that could show the similarities between the different episodes of censorship. Um. Yes, Ron. If I can parachute in, and if anybody else has a question and, and feels that they want to exercise their First Amendment rights, I gladly defer to them. Uh, uh, they don't have to invoke their Fifth Amendment right to remain silent in this crowd. Um, <laughs> Bob and Katie, um, it's so wonderful to have First Amendment lawyers talking about the First Amendment. And the reason I say that is, is that having spent 40 years in, having spent 40 years in the academy, uh, you know, when you read First Amendment law, you think it began in 1919. It's all right. centric. Uh, very little is ever mentioned about the lawyers who argued the case. And there's one fellow in particular, uh, Bob, I, I'd like you to uh, add or just comment about the whole absence in our school studies uh, in case books and what have you of lawyers from the picture. Um, there was a guy named Theodore Schroeder. Uh, who existed. Can you say a few things about that lawyer and author? And you know, it, is it, it that so many people in the First Amendment world don't know this guy's name? Remarkable to me. Well, it's remarkable too that people don't know about Anthony Comstock. And one of the reasons for that is because as First Amendment lawyers, uh, 
we learn First Amendment law in law school, and First Amendment begins in 1919, uh, right? That's when the Supreme Court starts uh, the, this series of cases. And so um, people learn about uh, the, the ACLU being formed and, and those cases, and then the development of First Amendment jurisprudence from there. But there's 50 years before that where you have uh, all of these arguments being made over very direct and draconian censorship efforts. And it spawned a pushback, a resistance. Uh, and there are a number of, of figures that uh, that defined that. But you're right, Theodore Schrader was the, the one that was probably the most significant. He was uh, the uh, uh, driving force behind an organization called the Free Speech League that was formed, I think, in 1906. I'd have to uh, double check that. but. It grew out of earlier efforts to oppose the Comstock Law. Uh, there was uh, the National Liberal League and then the National Defense Association following that, both trying to get repeal of the Comstock Law. And ultimately, there was a much broader organization funded by some of the same people who had been prosecuted by Comstock uh, called the Free Speech League. And what's remarkable about it is that Theodore Schrader had such a prodigious production of scholarly works and uh, books and pamphlets. Um, and, you know, at the time he was fighting a losing battle, right? I mean, the courts were not yet receptive to the arguments and yet they kept making them. Um, you know, Schrader had a, a treatise on obscenity law that he had to try to give away because even libraries uh, and some very large respectable libraries wouldn't even accept donated copies because they were afraid they were going to be prosecuted by Anthony Comstock. Um, but ultimately, the ideas propagated by people like, like Schrader won out. And uh, it's remarkable when you think, I mean, we as First Amendment lawyers operate in a very hospitable environment as much as, you know, it seemed contentious at the time. But we have a tradition of, of free speech protections and a level of First Amendment jurisprudence that makes us when we appear in court, um, have a level of presumption of protection that just didn't exist then. And it's hard to imagine someone fighting these battles for decades and, you know, finding it difficult to find any courts being receptive to their ideas. And yet uh, people like Theodore Schrader kept going, or, and, th and those he inspired, kept going back again and again until ultimately the tides shifted. By the way, there, there's a great book on, on that period um, by David Rabin uh, called Free Speech in His Forgotten Years. Uh, and, and that's where I first read about uh, Theodore Schrader. And uh, it, it's really a terrific book. It came out, uh, I think, in the 90s. I don't know if we have another. I actually, I had one other question, which is you sort of talked about in the book and we talked about tonight about, you know, what motivated Comstock. But... What motivated you to become a, a free speech lawyer? I hate bullies. Okay. <laughs> well, no, there are a lot of answers to that question. I mean, uh, one is just sort of a, a sort of a natural honoriness or anti-authoritarian streak, um, which may be saying the same thing. Uh, but also, uh, when I was in college, I worked as a reporter, and so I, that's when I first began to uh, get uh, some grounding in both. Uh, journalism and journalistic theory and 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 but also in, in beginning to study media law and uh, I fell in love with it and so from the time from that time on um, when I knew I was going to law school I knew I wanted to find a way to become a, a first amendment lawyer and you did <laughs> <laughs> still trying so oh yeah does anyone have any other questions Well, seeing no further questions, why don't we uh, wrap up? I want to thank both of you for a great program. Bob, the book is terrific. Uh, thank you for a very thoughtful discussion. I also want to thank you, Bob, for sending over some slides, which we've been able to display during the, the, your presentation, which have, uh, you know, it's cha it's challenging in the Zoom environment or WebEx environment, I guess I should say. So we very much appreciated that. And uh, 
there was one we didn't get to that I particularly liked. If Lisa could throw up, I just thought we might end with this because this always made me laugh. It's <laughs> called your, your slide of the revenge of the wasteland with the SS Minnow. Well, I, you know, I, I should provide a little bit of context for that because oh, that please. was a direct uh, response to Newton Minnow. Uh, Sherwood Schwartz, who produced, produced Gilligan's Island, uh, hated the vast wasteland speech. And uh, this was his way to uh, sort of get back at it. Um, he, he spelled the, the uh, minnow like the little fish uh, rather than the bureaucrat, but uh, Newton Minnow spells his name with one N. Um, but uh, nonetheless, that was, uh, uh, that was the response. I had no idea that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again, and uh, thank you for uh, participating in our abbreviated three-hour tour. And uh, we'll see everybody again for the next salon. Have Thanks a good so much. Everyone. Thank you.